So a little bit about uh, Josh here. Hi guys, I'm Josh. Uh, I work with Dave, I'm a security analyst there. Um, I do just about anything technical, including watching Dave m modify my slides. Because uh, Dave is a big Perl fan, he loves Perl, and uh, he programs solely in Perl. I do Python, so I mean, I'm not as good as him. He's being sarcastic. So the people give me a thumbs up, it's sarcasm. I do not like Perl. Dude, you should see all the things he's got out there in CPAN. So next slide. Um, <laughs> huh. So I have heavy experience in penetration testing and all that good stuff. Uh, wrote the Social Engineer Toolkit. Um, <laughs> woo! So really, how many people use it? We got two people. We got two. It's good. That's all, all I right. wanted. So we got heavy, I got a heavy military background, uh, deployed to Iraq a couple times and yada yada. Before we start I want to say a special thanks to Iron Geek and Kathy Peters. Kathy, you in here? Guess not. Thank you. <laughs> so let's do a little brief intro into PowerShell. Is anybody here familiar with PowerShell? Know what PowerShell is? Use PowerShell on a regular basis. That's great. So. Wow, that was a lot of people. It was a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> So it's installed by default on Windows 7 and Server 2008. Uh, in Windows 7 you cannot uninstall. Um, so it's basically embedded into the OS at this point. Uh, PowerShell basically is a fully flexible um, you know, Unix, Linux type uh, programming environment or bash environment. And it actually integrates completely into the .NET programming language, which we'll be seeing a lot of that today. So if you haven't seen it, it's really exciting. That's what it looks like. I don't know, can you guys tell that's blue? Uh -huh. Just so you know, that's blue. It's 2010 and we're still using the same command prompt from Windows 98. They upgraded, they put a PS it in front of it. It says PS in front of it, so yeah, that is better. And it's blue. The blue is kind of nice. You can make it transparent too. Hey. When you maximize though, it still goes, doesn't expand. Yeah. I think they would fix that by now. So PowerShell for hackers. You need to learn how to spell. Yeah. So we will be getting our, uh, uh, We'll be the first one to submit that uh, PowerShell is absolutely a benefit to uh, the IT as well as us as security professionals, right? Uh, you'll see a lot of demos here as proof of concept codes as well as um, if you go to my site at the end of this talk, uh, secmaniac.com, you can download all the proof of concept codes and new Metasploit modules and all that other good stuff. Um, but I'll say is, is for us from a security standpoint, we generally didn't have this type of programming language at the command line. Uh, the ability to completely interface with the .NET framework uh, and do whatever we want from an automation perspective is really sexy to us. Uh, and you'll be seeing a little bit of uh, a couple demonstrations as we go with that. Yeah, before we had to rely on like VBS scripts and batch files and stuff like that. And CSC. this were, yeah, they, not a lot of power in those, but this definitely takes a cake. So, execution policies. Want to talk a little about that? Yeah, the execution policies are there. It's kind of a security benefit, kind of, not really. Microsoft will even admit now that it's not really there for security. But you have restricted, which pretty much restricts all execution of PowerShell scripts on the system. You can still execute PowerShell and run your commands within the environment, but you can't execute the actual PS1 files that you have. Um, all sign requires all scripts to be signed before they can be executed. Uh, the other one's remote sign, so anything you download from the internet, um, it creates an alternative data stream and it will let uh, PowerShell know that it's been downloaded from the internet. And if it's not been signed, it will not execute. But you can still execute your own scripts that you've written. And then unrestricted is unrestricted. You can execute any PowerShell script that you want. So it's unrestricted? Um, that's what I heard. Okay. Sorry, I was confused. I, I, I couldn't tell. So release of Metasploit Module 1. I don't know if you guys remember, but in uh, Fast Track, um, what we used with, uh, uh, if you're doing SQL injection or uh, through specifically MS SQL or you find like a weak SA account or something like that, uh, what we were doing is we were taking a uh, binary, converting it to hexadecimal, and then using the XP command shell store procedure to write that hexadecimal representation of the binary to the underlying operating system. Try saying that three times fast. Did anyone here actually use Fast Track and use that part? Oh wow, okay, that's good. Okay, this is so new, this is all new to you guys. Awesome, great. So we just did this, that stuff never existed. Yeah. This is all new. Right. <laughs> Thanks buddy. I spent like four months on that. Anyways. Um, <laughs> Not so with me, you didn't. When it, when it gets, it gets uh, set to the underlying operating system as hex, we used to call Windows Debug to convert it back to a binary for us. Now there was a slight little problem. You had the 64K restrictions that Windows Debug has. So if your binary was larger than 64K, Debug would kank out and wouldn't allow you to do it. 
So what we ended up doing, or, or you know, the team that I was uh, with at the time, uh, basically wrote a small stager that just reads in hex and spits out binary. So we basically got around the um, debug execute uh, the debug 64k restriction. Now the problem is, is uh, as soon, shortly after that talk, they removed debug from all 64-bit systems. Uh, so the traditional method for payload delivery was no longer existent. So we're releasing a new Metasploit module called the PowerShell Debug. It allows you to do the exact same thing all through PowerShell. And one thing I'd like to say uh, with this, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few, bit, uh, few minutes, but these type of um, attacks, the PowerShell attacks, like Metasploit modules that will be shown, the, the bypass, the reverse and bind shell purely in PowerShell, or none of these are getting hit by AV or HIPS. So it's a completely new attack vector that no one's really looking at, uh, and you can basically get anything you want through the system, which is kind of nice. Oops. So a quick demo. You guys probably can't see that, huh? So I'll just I'll do a little narrative here for a second. Uh, we're just doing a quick nmap scan of a host. Nothing spectacular. We find that 1433 is open. We load up our favorite tool, Metasploit. And we're going to try to brute force the SA account. And the SA account is, if you're using uh, integrated or SQL authentication, it's the account that gets created by default, the sysadmin account for Microsoft SQL, if we didn't, weren't familiar with that. Very easy to find in large organizations. And we're going to go ahead and brute force this account. So very quickly with 255 threads, uh, it finds a SA account of, of blank. I'm sorry, with, uh, yeah, blank. So now we're going to load up our new uh, SQL, uh, MS SQL payload that will be put into the uh, Metasploit uh, repositories here virtually. I talked to HD, he's working on it. And um, basically we're going to go ahead and attack. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to, there's, there's new options added to this specific payload. So instead of using the debug version, it'll allow you to use the PowerShell version. So you just use PowerShell, set it to true. You turn off the old one and hit exploit. Now this is all going to take a executable, convert it to hex, put it on the learning operating system, bypass execution restriction policies, which we'll talk about in a second, and then we'll actually execute the payload on the system and we get a interpreter shell. That looked easy. So just a real quick recap, binary is converted to hex and placed into the file system. Convert script is created to take the hexadecimal and rewrite it back as a, bi uh, a byte array as binary. Uh, payload is now uh, on the system for execution. So execution restriction policies, um, you know, they're not, they shouldn't be relied upon for any type of protection whatsoever. Uh, they're really not designed for that. Uh, if you look at the sites and, and people talking about it, a lot of people do talk about it as a preventative measure for, you know, not allowing scripts to execute or not allowing to get specific code on the uh, system itself. It's really not designed for that and it's very easy to bypass. Um, execution restriction policies really do not help from a post exploitation perspective, period. Do you want to talk about this? Sure. Oh, so the, the, the create command uh, release, we'll be releasing the tool, it's also on, on secmaniac.com. Uh, basically the contents of the file are concatenated, compressed and converted to a base 64 string. Uh, the boilerplate bootstrap uh, created when we use specific calls, encoded command um, and command to basically invoke expressions for, um, use the invoke expression for executing our um, payload on the system. So basically what this essentially allows you to do is take any PowerShell script you want to, um, execute it, bypass all the execution restriction policies and allow you to run whatever you want to on the system itself. So with the most restrictive policy set on PowerShell, we can still execute whatever we want. Again, this really is not a security prevention method. Uh, no need to disable execution restriction policies through like registry interaction, reboots, et cetera, et cetera. We can just do it on the fly. So here's a quick demo. In this scenario, I'm actually going to be on the, the local system itself just to show you as a representation. So here we just created a macro to basically set the execution restriction policy to unrestricted. Um, and we're going to create a file. So we're, we, uh, we'll show you in the next slide. Uh, we wrote a, uh, a tool called PowerDump. And um, basically it'll, it'll dump the SAM database purely through PowerShell. So in this example we're going to actually use the PowerDump to get around the execution restriction policy through our new command create command. And so what it does is it actually sets out a bat file for you. A, a nice little bat file. You just double click the bat file, loads everything into PowerShell for you and you just call your function. 
So we're creating a service right here uh, as, as system so we can dump the SAM database. We're running a system right here. And we're going to go ahead and execute that specific bat file. It loads everything into PowerShell for us, and all I have to do is type dump hashes, and we have the hash values bypassing execution restriction policies. So what's really nice, go ahead. All right, so what's really nice, since we have full access to PowerShell and .NET libraries, we can do pretty much anything we want. Um, releasing today is a proof of concept of a reverse bind and a regular bind of a command shell, just as a proof of concept to see if we could really, you know, utilize the .NET libraries to, you know, do some post-exploitation stuff. One thing about that is it's purely coded in PowerShell. So, I mean, it's a bind and reverse, completely coded in PowerShell. We're actually looking at uh, editing that to the MSF payload libraries, um, as well as a few others, doing Meterpreter through PowerShell, a lot of other great things. And this was also written in PowerShell version 1, so this is compatible with both version 1 and version 2 that you see on all the newer operating systems. So a real quick demo of the, um, the new Metasploit module power dump. And we have to give a big shout out to Kathy Peters on this one because she's the one that coded most of this. Uh, I did a lot of the research, but she was the one that actually was able to get it done in, in time. So if you look here, we're running a fully patched Server 2008 R2 64 bit platform. All you do is specifically call the power dump executable or the um, add on. And it will go ahead and dump the hash values for us. Done. So All in PowerShell. You, who thought you could do that with PowerShell? So yeah. Interpreter-based module will dump the SAM database purely through PowerShell. Again, um, you can download them from our site if you want it immediately. Um, and it's broken up into two parts. So you know you have the Metasploit module zip file, and then you have the PowerShell base examples. Um, so either one, all the proof of concept code for PowerDump without having it in um, interpreter is also there as well. So anything that you want to go through and modify or add, go for it. So PowerDump is a meta, um, interpreter based module. We'll dump the same database for, 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 through PowerShell. It works on all operating systems, uh, both x86 uh, and 64 bit. Any, obviously, anything that has PowerShell installed on it. Uh, which in Service Pack 3 it's an optional update, uh, and Windows Vista it's an optional update, but Windows 7 um, and Server 2008 it's 100% uh, you know, installed by default. Another interesting component with PowerShell is there's going to be full, there already is full integration into Exchange 2010 uh, as well as any new Microsoft product that comes out. So PowerShell will be 100% integrated into pretty much every aspect of the Microsoft product line, which will definitely be you know, beneficial for us as we're going through and performing penetration tests um, and doing different things. I mean, you're talking about a whole new vector of tools and you know, different ways of, of attacking systems that you know, we generally didn't have before. So one of the tools I write is the Social Engineer Toolkit, and it's very applicable to what we're going to do here because I have here a Tinsy device, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, for, you, for those of you that don't know the Social Engineer Toolkit, um, it's a tool for social engineering. <laughs> That's about it. No creative name there. Yeah. It's also called Set. Uh, for some reason, I had this fascination with Arnold Palmer for the past like six months. My, every time my wife goes to the store, she buys the whole store out. So I have like gallons and gallons and gallons of Arnold Palmer. And I tell you, every time I drink Arnold Palmer, I crank out like 10,000 lines of code. So I really recommend if you're a hacker and you code, Arnold Palmer will basically make you, uh, will be, let, let you uh, present at DEF CON. Yeah, trade so. out your Mountain Dew, trade out your Dr. Pepper, get Arnold Palmer. You're, are you tired of getting rejected? You know, you're tired of getting your submissions rejected? Drink Arnold Palmer and you'll be speaking at DEF CON. Look at me, I'm here. You don't drink Arnold Palmer. I know. <laughs> Tastes nasty. Oh, dude. <laughs> get off stage. Get off. Just go. Dude, I almost broke my hand trying to get in your trunk because the Arnold Palmer was falling onto me. Yeah, so Walgreens uh, around the corner has actually sold out of Arnold Palmer. I was coming back with like three bags. You know, my arms are like extremely sore right now. It's going good. But uh, they're all gone. So the basics is said, it's open source. It's purely programmed in Python. Python. I'm working on a Perl version of it. Was that the archaic 1970s programming language toolkit? <laughs> Sorry, Perl guys. I, I really apologize. That was that was harsh. I think um, Jabra hates you now. 
Yeah, most likely. Uh, so it has integration of Metasploit for both the exploit repository and client side attacks and the payloads. Uh, multiple attack vectors specifically designed for social engineering. For good, not bad. Help penetration testers and organizations secure your program. It's, you know, again, use this for your good. Uh, you're going to see a couple of demos here that are specifically related to PowerShell and actually one that's not, but um, that will definitely help you as you're doing penetration tests or you're trying to hack your mom's computer or whatever you guys do on your spare time. Um, it's up to you. Legally. So the USB hit attack vector, really cool. Have you guys seen the Tenzi devices? Adriano Tenzi devices? Did anyone see Adrian's talk yesterday about this? Did you see Adrian's talk yesterday? Great. Did a phenomenal job, phenomenal job. Well, we've been working with Adrian. Adrian's got some really cool stuff he's doing. Uh, so, what we decided to do was take one of these Tenzi devices and do a PowerShell based payload on it that will compromise the system. Um, so, basically, you insert this you know, USB device into any computer you want to, and you can actually make it multi platform. So it doesn't have to be PowerShell. It can be Linux, OS X, or Windows, or whatever, or uh, the Hannah Montana d Linux distribution. Any of those will work. <laughs> and uh, that's my primary operating system. Um, it's for my wife. I'm just kidding, guys. It's awesome. It is awesome. The music plays in the. Oh, that's great. But uh, basically, when you plug it in, it gets recognized as a keyboard. So that means auto run, all that good stuff is pretty much out the window, right? It emulates exactly what you're going to do from a keyboard perspective. So as soon as you plug it in, I simulate keystrokes. So it does like 140 to 280 characters per second. It's actually more than that, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot more than that. Yeah, sorry, thanks. Um, and basically, it will execute a payload on the system. Basically, we're only restricted by how fast the buffer is on the program. Did they code that in Perl? Uh, no, they didn't okay. code that in Perl. I was just checking. At least on a Windows system. I was just checking. I mean, you never know. Uh, so you can drop a payload on the system either through PowerShell or WScript or the two main methods. Uh, automatic creation of the attack vector through set. That's, that, that's the big thing. That's why I wanted to show set today. It will actually create the attack vector for you, create the PDE device which you can load into Adreno and then copy it over and you'll see an example of that. And it will compromise the computer for you. So how easy does it get? We're going to load up uh, Backtrack 4, right? Everybody uses Backtrack 4? Yep. yep. Come on. Wow, that's not a lot of people. It's Sunday. I'm not, I'm not, you know. <coughs> the Hannah Montana party was yesterday. So we're going to go ahead and load up set. Uh, you know, again, codename Arnold Palmer. I already got the, the, uh, the version of 7, which is going to be awesome. So pretty funny. Every, I, I try coming up with different ones every time. But what we're going to do is we're going to do number uh, six, which is the Tinsy USB hit attack vector. As soon as you select that, it's going to say what attack vector do you want to use? Do you want to use a purely PowerShell based reverse shell? Do you want to do a WScript HTTP uh, MSF payload? Or do you want to do a PowerShell HTTP GET MSF payload? In this example, I'll use PowerShell. Second, I want to show you the WScript one because it has more of a presentation experience. Looks better. So it's going to ask if you want to create a payload. I'm going to hit yep, absolutely. Type in my IP address. And then here we get options to use Metasploit. So we're going to hit the default, which is Meterpreter. And then we're going to backdoor the executable. So with an MSF encode and MSF payload, right, you can take a, an, a legitimate executable and shove Meterpreter on the bottom of it so it has better AV detection. What I found was when you're actually executing um, payloads on the client side, if it has a command, it have any type of command interface to it, it's going to pop up a black window to the user. So obviously you don't want that when you're doing a social engineering attack, and it's probably going to be kind of suspicious. Um, well, at least if you're, not, if you're using Hannah Montana OS, it's probably not. But um, basically, what ends up happening, what I ended up doing was I took a version of Calc and I just modified it so it was basically broken. But it, the execution flow within assembly still works perfectly and everything like that, but nothing pops up. So I have that built into set, and what ends up, what ends up happening is when you backdoor the executable, it puts the interpreter stuff on the bottom of it, when the payload executes, the user's not presented with anything at all, which is great. We use the default port 443. And we're going to hey, start up our, our little listener here. Now, if you look, it says uh, was able to extra, um, create the PDE file under report sla uh, slash tinsy So what we're going to do is we're going to copy that to our OS X machine. All right. Oops. All right. So we have our Tinsy.pde device here. 
Now there's two things to, to take special note of. There's the Adreno based application which is basically the developer IDE for programming Adreno based devices. So the small microchip, microprocessor type devices, uh, that's what you do all your programming in. On the left hand side this is the Tenzi loader. Uh, so this is what actually uploads your, your bad stuff to this device here. So all we're going to do is just simply drag this over and we have all our code automatically generated for us with our IP address, set, sets up the web server for you, the listener, everything else for you and then you insert your USB device and you upload it. So it programmed, it reboots and we're all set. So now we have our malicious um, USB fuck device. <laughs> There you go. So we're going to take this and we're on a server 2008 fully patched, all that good stuff, right? We're going to plug it in. Interpreter. So let's just uh, back this up real quick and do the exact same attack vector um, all through uh, PowerShell because it actually is not as cool looking but it's actually a lot more efficient. So if you're going after a system and what's cool about these, if you look and you can see it's kind of hard to tell but there's dip switches on here. Thanks again Adrian. Uh, the dip switches allow you to program different payloads per dip switch that's flipped. So if you want to do, you know, you're coming up to a server 2008 machine, you insert it, you hit dip switch 2, it tar tar you know, targets PowerShell based systems. You hit dip switch 3, it targets OS X. You hit dip switch 4, it pops up a, uh, you know, message box saying ha ha, you know, whatever you got, you know. So basically you can program it to do whatever you want to, use any dip switch you want to, have multiple payloads, it's all great. So we're a little upset again. We'll go to the Tinsy USB hit attack factor, the PowerShell. We're going to create a payload. We're going to type in our IP address. We're going to do all the defaults. And it's under reports Tinsy slash PDE. So we're going to go ahead and copy this over again. Easy. Sometimes it doesn't take. So. Hang on one second, sorry about that. All right, so I'm just copying the file back over again. It didn't, uh, it didn't overwrite the other one for some reason. Alright, good, we got our PowerShell payload. We're gonna go ahead and upload this cat. This guy. And these PD files are completely customizable. Um, you know, and there's actually um, on the website there's multiple different types of uh you should press the button. Yeah, one second here. There's actually multiple different types of attacks you can use with this. This is just an example. All right, so it'll go ahead and reboot. All right, we're good. So again, in PowerShell, my hands are off. <laughs> Actually, I can't type that fast anyway. I don't know. You can move pretty fast. There it goes. That is all you needed. So it actually executed the PowerShell script. Now it's executing our payload. Next, we got Meterpreter.
That was cool. It yeah, worked. That was pretty cool. I was impressed it worked. Def Con 16, man. Whew. Glad these demos are working. <laughs> so integrating into existing hardware. Josh, why don't you talk about this a little bit? All right, so um, we did this as a practical joke to one of the guys in the office. Uh, he went away for a week and uh, was getting a new computer, so we wanted to mess with him really good. Uh, what I did was took apart the back of the keyboard, soldered uh, a, just this little bit of a USB cable to the back of it. Uh, this, uh, it's a Dell keyboard, it's got USB hub built into it, and I plugged a Tensy right into it, screwed it all back together. No one could tell any difference about it. So I plugged it into his keyboard or into his docking station. He came back to work the next day, and um, all of a sudden his mouse started moving on him. Now I had programmed the Tensy to just move the mouse a little bit and click. So every 30 seconds. So it gets better. It gets yeah, much yeah. better. So, 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 okay, so if day one goes by, he's sitting there typing Word documents, constantly messing them up, getting frustrated. It's just, he's having a horrible day. Well, so, and I had to go out of the office. So as this is going, you know, I know what's going on because I'm sitting there cracking yeah, up. As he's, as he's putting this back together, I'm sitting there like laughing my butt off. Yeah, we were, uh, this was a test run to see if we could do this to someone else higher up in the office. Right, so yeah. So we're not doing that. We didn't do that, though. Oh, no, this, we found out this was way this too not, damaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not good. So, so anyways, before you get into that, so I leave the office for like three days. So figuring if it got out of hand, they'd probably stop doing it, right? Yeah. yeah. So, all right, so we know he's getting a new computer. So he gets his new computer. He thinks all the problems are going to go away with this. And uh, lo and behold, he keeps the same docking station, same keyboard, same mouse, and boom, the problems start up again. He's like, what, what the hell's going on? This is a Windows 7 box. It should be wor working perfectly. You know, he's you know, doing all sorts of stuff, and he's just getting so frustrated. He's just... So he's like, okay, fine, it's gotta be the mouse. Changes out his mouse, comes back, plugs it in, boom, starts up again. He's like, he's frustrated, so it's okay, so logical troubleshooting, it's gotta be the docking station. Changes out the docking station, does it again. He's getting so frustrated that he's, get, he's got a new keyboard on the way. He's also started to put in a request for a new computer. So uh, I, get, I get at the office, and this guy is literally you know, pulling his hair out, and he's like, I just ordered another computer, I can't figure out, I'm like, all right, wait a minute. <laughs> Thankfully, Dave pulls him into the office before he starts to switch out his uh, keyboard, and uh, I'm able to grab my keyboard that has a Tensi device in it so he doesn't throw that away, because uh, I don't want to lose that. Yeah, thing. so we actually didn't tell him because uh, he was really upset. So, you know, I, I, so I pulled the, hey, man, I got to talk to you about uh, that stuff you're doing over there. Uh, why don't you come over to my office for a little bit? And, you know, did the whole swap the keyboard. Um, and, you know, and you're sitting there, and you're like, man, I really only wish this was like a 10-second conversation, but then it goes on for like 30 minutes. But it worked, and he never knew the difference. So magically, yeah, it started fixing it. Yeah, so magically, it started fixing Wait, it. Wait, these aren't recorded, are they? I didn't say any names. Well, I mean, he's going to know exactly what happened when they, you know. <laughs> yeah, that keyboard's sitting on my desk still. Oh, um, crap. Well, you do. Well, the funny part about it was one of the other guys uh, that's in the audience right now was listening in, and he knew what was going on. And uh, he had to listen to this other guy who we were playing joke on uh, complain yeah, you know, about it, and he didn't even have the heart to tell him either. So well, you know, I figured, I figured, you know, as this dude's sitting there spending like half his day trying to fix his keyboard and stuff, you know, and, and he goes over to Ryan. He's right there. Actually, why don't you raise your hand, Ryan? You can stand up. Actually, why don't you stand up? Stand up. I, I, I wasn't going to call him out. Stand up. Yeah, Ryan. Ryan. Ryan Elkins. Anybody want to give him a clap? Way to keep the joke going. Way to keep the joke going. So he, uh, you know. The guy comes over and he's like, dude, my computer's so messed up, man. I'm so upset. He's like, I cannot figure it out. I'm so frustrated. And Ryan's like, dude, that sucks. <laughs> that sucks, have you, man. Have you tried changing out the, key, uh, the mouse yet? Yeah, he's like, dude, the mouse. It's got to be the mouse. <laughs> like, come on, man. It's three days. He's swapping out his, key, his uh, laptop. Oh, well. Hey, it's so, all good and fun, fun and games, right? Yeah, yeah we, uh, Dave told him. Dave told him about a week later. He hasn't talked to me since. <laughs> or me. And I'm his boss. Not good. So this is what the keyboard looks like put back together. Does it look like a keyboard to you guys? Yeah. yeah. It's a keyboard. Now, if you were in Iron Geek's talk yesterday, you can also see that you can embed this into pretty much anything you want to. This is just, uh, it's a little bit bigger than you, you might, might see, but uh, the, the chipset is only that big. So, I mean, you can fit it into, like, anything you want to. Yeah, Iron Geek was actually able to fit a hub, a SD card, a Tensi, and all of that into just a normal mouse. And some LEDs, too, to make it look really cool. That is cool. I want one. Me too. 
So kind of off topic here, but I just want to show you the powerful stuff with set. Um, is it, there's a, the Java applet attack vector with it and that's pretty much the, the meat and potatoes of the social engineer toolkit. Um, if you guys want to do 100% success rate on your pen test, I recommend this right here. 100% success rate. If it doesn't work, I'm not going to pay you anything for that, that comment, but I mean it will work. So let's just say a real quick demo here. Oh, Let me just prep my config. You're doing this one live too. Dude, I know. Last minute's going to be awesome. Demo gods. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to load set and it has the website attack vector. We're going to select the Java applet attack method. Now here's where we can do if I actually wanted to use DEF CON's wireless, um, I could do a cyclone using DEF CON's wireless on stage. Yeah, if that was a Windows box, it blue screen immediately. Yeah. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use the web templates. What we can do is you can actually clone an entire site. So it automatically, we say you're going after company X. Hopefully there's not a company X out there. Um, it's company X and it'll actually go and rip their site off completely, set up a web server with it, with the, all the malicious Java applet code in it. And basically when they, when they go and browse the site, it looks identical in every way, shape, and form to whatever, you know, company you have cloned. In this example, we're just going to use the web templates. We're going to set our interface IP address since I'm not connected to the internet. And then we're going to sign our Java applet. So in this instance, we'll be pretending we're Google because we love all Google. Google does no evil, right? I like Google. Google's good. Google. So we're going to hit three for the Google. These are just different uh, templates that are built in, but you can, you know, definitely uh, clone any so you want to. And um, we're going to select the defaults. Look familiar? Interpreter. Backdoor executable, port 443, look good. And what's interesting enough about this payload is it works for Linux, OS X, and Windows. <laughs> yeah, Java makes everything nice, doesn't it? So we'll go ahead and just do an example of uh, OS X. So it sets up the li listener for us, the web server, all that good stuff, right? Now we're going to go ahead and go to the site. I hope you prayed to the demo gods last night. I did. They're going to be fine. They're cool. Okay. Ooh. And we get this warning saying, Google, the publisher, wants you to run this Java applet. Do you want to continue? <laughs> Dude, it's Google. I'm not saying no to Google. I know better than that. If I say if I say cancel, my computer's crashing. I can't search the internet. Nothing works. Yeah, there's no other search engines out there. Yeah. What's up? You have to use Bing. What's that? <laughs> Sounds cool. So we go ahead and hit run. Now, if I was actually connected to the internet, um, you would actually see the obviously the logo there and everything else looking pretty. Since we don't have internet, it's not doing that. Uh, but interesting enough, as soon as the payload executes. Um, it redirects you back to the legitimate Google site. So you never even knew that you were at a malicious site. And while we're there, on the back end, we have interpreter shells. Yes, the demo god smiled upon you today. Dude, I had no worries. I sacrificed five lambs. No worries. So I got to give a shout out to uh, Thomas Worth who helped me write the, or pretty much he wrote the, uh, the Java Apple Attack Vector. It was closed source. Uh, we initially released it at ShmooCon closed source and heavily obfuscated. Um, but we did open source it with version 0.6 which, which was released at B-Sides on Wednesday. Um, so you can actually manipulate the source code for this, uh, use anything you want to with it, do what you want to, it's all open source. Um, so again, special thanks to Thomas Worth for that. So basically the user hits run, the payload is executed on the victim's machine, redirects the user back to the original site and makes the attack less uh, conspicuous. Would anybody not fall for that? Oh yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So getting back onto the PowerShell kick, what does this really mean? Well for one, antivirus and host-based intrusion prevention systems are doing a squat for this right now. Um, yeah, I think there's only one PowerShell script that they actually catch, and it's an old uh, Trojan that was written back when uh, PowerShell was codenamed Monad, uh, that used Kazaa to do uh, just to move around from system to system, and just really did nothing. It was more of a proof of concept. That's the only one that I've seen in the uh, AV databases. 
And uh, it's actually a problem. I mean, we've been this, before this presentation, before the Black Hat presentation. Uh, I do have to give a uh, special shout out and kudos to Microsoft because they're very responsive. Uh, we basically sent them all of our proof of concept code, our slides, everything else, um, and they, um, they definitely did a good job at uh, basically looking at what we're doing, you know, seeing what ideas we had. So definitely a shout out to them for uh, the responsiveness that they had. They even cleaned up some of our code. It was nice. Yeah, they did actually. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, we're sloppy coders, man. I mean, you're trying to bang this out for DevCon, kind of like. Dude, I mean, he codes in Perl all day. I mean, what do you expect? Dude, dude, you insult me one more time. Does anybody here have a knife? Actually, don't answer that. Don't answer that. Yeah, please, please don't answer that. My wife wants to see me. Don't. No, I, I'm worried about the goons coming and kicking their ass. Oh, good point. Um, Those guys are rough. So where was I? I'm sorry. Uh, the hips, AV, stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Microsoft. The usefulness uh, of PowerShell really does enable us to be able to perform these type of advanced attack vectors with PowerShell. I mean, it's you guys it just. I really recommend just picking up a book on this. And if you already know .NET, this is going to be absolutely trivial for you to pick up. Um, you have full range to use the .NET libraries in in PowerShell. Completely call them from there. So you can write complete tools. You can write GUIs. I mean, you can write whatever you want to through the PowerShell command line interface. Which means for us. We can do a lot of cool things. Yeah, one of the IDEs that's out there for PowerShell, uh, Power GUI, is actually written all in PowerShell. So, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive what you can do with it. So, some future plans: uh, process injection and code uh, injection capabilities within PowerShell. So, the ability to inject into already existing processes and migrate to others uh, is something that we're working on right now. So, if you think about it, uh, you know, uh, PowerShell-based interpreter would be pretty sweet to have and do that all through PowerShell. Pretty cool. Uh, the ability to uh, deploy security baselines for multiple systems and ensure enforcement. I mean, there's like, just as an example, there's just so much automation you can do, so many different checks and things like that that you can do. Um, working on the Power, uh, PowerShell exploitation framework, uh, PEF. I mean, I don't, I don't know where I came up with that. But yeah, it sounds cool. Uh, and and integrated into by. MSF. Uh, so, trying to work on the PowerShell exploitation framework so that you can build specific tools and attack vectors all through PowerShell would be pretty sweet. Uh, definitely a shout out. We're going to be doing a conference in um, September 30th, it's October 2nd, 2011. So keep your eyes out for DerbyCon. Uh, we already have a lot of good speakers out there, so keep your eye out DerbyCon.com. And my boys at social-engineer.org. Did anybody participate in the captured flag or see it? The, the social engineer captured flag. A lot of people, a lot of good results, uh, making a lot of uh, a media out there. Um, definitely check out social-engineer.org. Uh, they are phenomenal. The podcast we actually just got done. Um, um, finishing. You actually uh, had to bail out early. I had to bail out early for this talk. I mean, you know, but. And really special thanks to Kathy Peters. Uh, be sure to check out www.secmaniac.com. That's S E C, not S A C. Um, secmaniac.com. Secman. And you can always follow me and Josh on Twitter. I'm Dave underscore R E L 1 K. So Dave underscore relic and winfang98. Now, does anybody have any questions? No questions? Does that mean I did a good job? Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You guys rock. Defcon.